Good evening. It is great to be back. Uh, welcome to our Monday, August 21st, 2023 Board of Education meeting. Uh, before we begin, if you could just take a second and flip your phones to silent. And then when you're done doing that, join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, everyone. Okay, Mr. Hatfield. All right. Take a roll. My pleasure. Uh, President McFarland. Here. Vice President Rausch. Here. Secretary Hatfield is present. Treasurer Lauterbach is not here. Member Blazy. Here. Member Ringgold. Here. Member Horowitz. Here. All right. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, moving on to item two in our agenda, we have a consent agenda. 2.1 is the approval of the minutes from July 17, 2023. 2.2 uh, .2 is a list of staff that are being recommended for hire. And we'll come back to that in a second. Uh, 2.3 is a list of staff that have announced their resignations as well as their effective dates. Item 2.4, uh, the financials are not available for approval until the September Board of Education meeting. Um, item 2.5 is a list of legal bills for approval. And coming back to our list of um, hirees, uh, we have tonight with us Miss um, Yang Chow. Welcome. Um, if you want to take a moment and please introduce yourself. Hi, everybody. It's nice to meet you here. Um, it's my pleasure and honor to take this new position as the new director of DEI. Um, I originally come from Shanghai, China, a city slightly bigger than Midland. <laughs> um, I received almost 10 years of my postgraduate education here in the States. Uh, so I think it's time for, for me to give back. Um, my comfort zone has always been in teaching for colleges, but I'm passionate about kids and uh, Midland Public School too. Um, so, I mean, DEI is hard work. I mean, it's, it's a work with a lot of controversials, the work with a lot of resistance. Any fight against the established status quo is not going to be difficult, it's not going to be easy. So, um, but I'm passionate and uh, we will see, you know, what we can do uh, to change uh, even just little by little. And maybe hopefully there's no fight at all. You know, if we could solve things peacefully. Uh, I've been an international peacekeeper when I was working for the United Nations. So let's see what we can do together. And thank you so much in advance for being so patient with me as we navigate through this uh, territory. And um, I'm very, I, I really look forward to work with all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, with that, I will accept a motion for the consent agenda. Make a motion to approve items 2.1 through 2.5 as listed in the consent agenda. Support. Motion by Mr. Rausch, support by Mr. Hatfield. Any additional discussion regarding the consent agenda? Okay, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, motion carries. Thank you very much. Uh, moving on, we have presentations to the board. Uh, we have item 3.1. Uh, Penny Miller Nelson. Bridget, come on up. <laughs> No stranger to the spotlight. We'll stand right here, okay? Um, so I'm so excited to announce that Bridget is our Michigan Region 4 Teacher of the Year. And it is such a special occasion when one of our own is recognized outside of our local district for being exceptional. We are so proud of you. Come, come uh, you friend. should know that uh, come, this come, is come awkward, right isn't it? <laughs> yes, come on up. You can stand here. You can stand here. You should here. know that on yeah. August 8th, Bridget was recognized by the State Board of Education, and State Superintendent Dr. Michael Rice actually gave her a lovely award uh, in front of a great crowd and lots of pictures. Her family was there. It was a wonderful celebration. Uh, you should also know an interesting fact that Bridget has been earning distinction since the beginning. She did her student teaching here at Parkdale Elementary. And during that time in 1992, she was honored as the CMU Student Teacher of the Year. So even in the beginning, <laughs> she was exceptional and has hung with us since. 
you spent a bit of time downstate because we didn't have any openings right after your student teaching. That's right. And then Brad Vandervliet, who's the principal at Parkdale, called her and recruited her to come back. <laughs> and she was excited to return. Yeah. We're so glad she did. Four years at Parkdale, then to Northeast, mm -hmm. where she uh, stayed there through 2017. Correct. And then at Dow High, where she's been since. Always part of our special services department always serving our students with cognitive impairments. And I am going to look at my notes for this part because these words are lovely, things that colleagues, parents, uh, and, and friends have said about her. She has boundless enthusiasm. You are a nurturer, highly collaborative. You're a leader, an advocate for students and your colleagues. You are deeply caring dedicated, trustworthy, and then I shared this one at opening session, but it's worth sharing again that you have a zeal to help students progress in their skills. So these are all ways that Bridget has been described and now we can add to the list Michigan Region 4 Teacher of the Year. Congratulations. You've seen this before. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you very much. Yes. And if you want to take the podium, go ahead. Thank a few you. words to share with us Thank and you. we'll describe a little bit about what this experience means <clears throat> for her. Thank you for inviting me here this evening. Being named Regional Teacher of the Year has been an exciting journey. Since being granted the award, I've been recognized by the State Board of Education. I've been asked to join the Special Education Advisory Council as well as the Michigan Teacher Leadership Advisory Council. I'll be presenting at the CMU Teacher Candidate Conference and participating in the Delta Kappa Gamma Society Conference for Key Women Educators, and that's just in the first six weeks of school. But all of the buzz and the busyness, the title has been a humbling experience. My immediate thoughts were, why me? Perhaps it was because I've taught for over 30 years. Perhaps it's because I've taught at all three levels, the elementary, middle, and high school or maybe because I've dedicated myself to teaching students with special needs. But the more I thought about it, it occurred to me that I know why I was selected. I was in the right spot at the right time. I feel like my career could be a chapter from the book Outliers by Malcolm Gladwell. The author makes the case that talent and hard work are not enough. True outliers also need family, culture, community, and some plain old good luck. So I'd like to take a minute to thank those whose impact on me made this award possible. First, I would like to thank my parents, who were both teachers for over 30 years for Goodrich Public Schools, my extended family for your support, and my amazing husband, Joe, who's helped me every year with preparation for the new school year, and has never complained when date night involved sharpening colored pencils, <laughs> designing bulletin boards, shopping for materials, or feeding the mealworms. I still remember the elated feeling when I was first hired and offered my dream job at Parkdale Elementary. Over the years, I've been so fortunate to have top-notch paraprofessionals in my classes, amazing teachers to co-teach alongside of, and strong leadership from administrators and the school board. For a large portion of my career, I've worked with the Cognitively Impaired Program and I've had students for multiple years. This has given me opportunities to build strong relationships with families and students. It was the Grace A. Dow Library that drew me to Midland in the first place. And the city of Midland provides tremendous support for our MPS families. I've worked closely with Disability Network, the Arc of Midland, Michigan Rehabilitation Services, and the MX MSU Extension. As you have heard, all of these occurrences and interactions have made me who I am. And working in a district such as Midland Public Schools has been a blessing. I take my responsibility as Regional Teacher of the Year seriously. And I'm honored to represent the CI program, Dow High, Midland Public Schools, and the region surrounding us. While working with the state to share feedback and input on educational policies and propose ways to enhance student learning. I would also like to take this time to personally thank Superintendent Miller Nelson for all of her support as she has shown me over the years. MPS is fortunate to have you as our leader. I'd also like to thank 
Principal Cochran for getting Dow High off to a great year, and Superintendent Jaster for all of your support over the years as well, and for the school board for your service and for acknowledging me this evening. Thank you. I told Bridget part of her honor is that she can leave right after her presentation. <laughs> Thank you again. Okay, next up, item 3.2, we have a host of wonderful presenters to, that are going to tell us about summer programming. So, uh, Jen Servos and company, you are welcome to take the floor. There you go. Sure. There you go. All right. Yes. Yeah, so good evening. Um, again, I'm Jen Service. I'm uh, on behalf of myself and members of uh, the curriculum team are here. We have principals and teachers. Uh, we would like to thank you for having us this evening. And we are really excited to share with you the comprehensive summer program that MPS offered this year, beginning in elementary school and running all the way through high school. Next is Joe Amaboli. Good evening. Uh, my name is Joe Amaboli, and I have the honor and privilege of talking from 50,000 50, feet in the air of the uh, summer school vision. And just the testament to everybody here who's presenting in the, the next 15 minutes to the work that's went into making this a valuable experience for our students. Uh, just, I think, one of the biggest focuses has been student engagement and um, just the overall uh, whole child focus on students this year. I think every year uh, we look for better ways to improve the summer school experience and this year I think they knocked it out of the park again. So um, again, uh, multiple learning modalities is what we want to focus on. At the elementary um, they incorporated some mindfulness into the, what they were doing. There were thematic units at the middle school and then the high school is going to speak to some of the different ways they use technology as well. And I just do want to mention that there was transportation was available again this summer and breakfast and lunch was served uh, daily in most buildings as well. And I'm going to hand it over to Kim Funnel now. Um, I'm just going to explain the different funding sources that went to support our program this year. Um, Title I, uh, we as a district share those funds with Central Park and Plymouth. Um, so those funds were uh, only spent at those buildings. 11T was a federal fund that was um, given to Midland Public Schools along with many, many schools um, in a package with ESSER monies. And so that particular um, fund has some um, parameters around it. We are held to spend a certain percentage during the year, a uh, certain percentage after school programs, and a certain percentage during summer school programs. And then um, we can only spend that money on a particular group of students that qualify um, based on a, a list of qualifying factors. Um, and then we had Section 31A. It's a state at-risk fund um, that went to support uh, many programs at all of our buildings. In this past year, State of Michigan offered a Section 98C, which was a learning loss grant. Um, that, again, was leftover ESSER II funds. So as, as that um, pot of money expired, the state did not want to give back to um, the national level. So they repurposed some of those funds, um, i.e. 98C. So we were thankful for those monies as well. And then to round out our, our uh, summer funding, we had um, Section 41A, which is a bilingual grant. And we were able to partner with the Legacy Center. Um, I'll touch on that a little bit more, but we, we utilized those funds for a specific population of students. Um, and we really uh, were able to touch many, many students across the district with all of these fundings. All right, so I will kick off talking um, about what elementary looked like. So our summer learning program in elementary started the second week of June, and it ran through early August, uh, with the exception of the two weeks in July. Uh, we had 419 students participate this year, 40 more students this year than last year. Uh, so we were really pleased with that. We had 52 teachers participate and 26 paraprofessionals. Um, like years past, uh, the main focus was English language arts and math. 
uh, either you know teacher recommendations um, on students to participate. We also took a close look at NWEA scores as well throughout the year. Um, I think as Joe mentioned earlier, uh, there was an SEL component this year, so the SEL specialists were able to support in the elementary buildings throughout summer school, which was a huge asset, uh, very well received. Uh, we had a few different learning models. So uh, the majority of elementary schools used a tutoring or small group instruction model uh, where you know up to maybe three students would come for an hour at a time. Some had an hour and a half, some two hours, and students rotated through that way. Uh, Central Park uh, offered a more traditional type summer school model. They found last year the feedback from families was that it was hard with an hour here and an hour there. Uh, they were looking more for the 8.30 to 1.30 experience. And so they went back to that model at Central Park this year and it was very well received. Uh, lots of really, really great feedback. Uh, so that was great that we were responsive to that. And all in all, we had 90% attendance across the board in elementary school for the summer learning experience, which I think is pretty phenomenal. When you take into all of the other things that happen during summer, um, <coughs> families really did prioritize this learning uh, for their children, so that was exceptional. In addition to that, uh, Central Park and Plymouth also offer what they call kindergarten readiness, and so Kara Stark is here, principal from Central Park, to share a little bit about what that experience was like. All right, good evening. Um, as Jen mentioned, I'm Kara Stark, the principal of Central Park Elementary. I have the honor to talk about kindergarten readiness program. So we have Title I funds at Central Park in Plymouth and a few years ago, some of the staff members at Central Park started discussing the need for more support for transitioning students into kindergarten. It can be extremely overwhelming. Um, the teachers need more supports of kind of getting them into a routine and being able to support them, you know, whether they need a visual schedule to support them, whatever it may be. So we decided that to help those kiddos, we reached out to local daycares, we were speaking with parents when they enrolled their students, and we just de determined to use Title I-A funds to do a kindergarten readiness program. It was a week long, and we tried to do it from 9 to 1 o'clock, so it wasn't overwhelming. It wasn't a full day of school, but it was right the first, it was last week, so or a couple of weeks ago, so it was leading up to that first day of school. It was a specialized experience for just kindergarten. Um, our kindergarten staff were the ones who were able to run that program so our teachers actually got to know each of the students really well and be able to see what supports um, we could we could assist them with uh, we had about 17 students at each school plymouth and central park so that meant we were able to have small groups which was really nice to be able to get to know the kids and ease them into that huge school uh, they were able to walk down to the lunchroom what does the cafeteria line look like how do I order my food how do I get into school some of those worries that kiddos have when they're first coming we also were able to provide transportation so that was huge to also allow kids experience on a bus how do I get onto the bus how do I get off all of those things we were able to also staff kindergarten readiness program we had kindergarten teachers family intervention specialists behavior intervention specialists and our paraprofessionals so that was extremely nice to be able to kind of just wrap around those kids um, and we tried to select students that truly needed that support with transitions some kids are ready to walk into kindergarten and start on day one but others might need a little more support there we also tied in a parent component to this so we were able to we had our SEL specialist there as well and between our SEL specialist and our family intervention specialist they presented to parents on just kind of how to develop and establish routines for your kindergarten child as they enter school how what reading may look like at home zones of regulations when you know any of you that have littles they can have all the emotions and that's okay but just how to help manage those and then also our family intervention specialists were able to speak to what their roles are in our buildings and like I said we also tied in mindfulness so that was our program 
All right, and just to round out uh, elementary, we sent surveys to students, to teachers, and to families uh, asking for feedback, and I thought I'd share a few quotes with you. So from teachers, um, they love the flexibility, the ability to schedule and plan specifically with families. Uh, many teachers at Central Park loved going back to the traditional model with the small class size, felt like they accomplished quite a bit. And then on the flip side of that, those that had the tutoring style, uh, students were really engaged, uh, loved the one-on-one -on -one or small group attention that they received. From parents, they noted the great progress in reading that was made over the summer. Um, my daughter loved being there and wished it was longer. So we do, we're doing something right. Uh, they really appreciated the bus drop off and, and pick up and felt that that was uh, really beneficial in helping their family and their students attend. And from students, uh, I feel like I got better at math. We had to work really hard, but we got breaks, so it felt like it was just right. Um, I liked it a lot better than when I was in fourth grade. In fourth grade, I got confused a lot, but at summer school, my teacher got to help me one-on-one, -on -one, and it really helped. And then, last but not least, summer school was great. I got smarter. <laughs> and on to middle school with Andy Filipek. Yes, uh, I'm Andy Filipek. This is my second year running the uh, middle school programs, so both Northeast and Jefferson. This year we had between about 130 and 140 students uh, combined. Uh, we had, at each school, we had 11 teachers, two paras, uh, myself, and also an administrative intern. So uh, one big shout out needs to go to Morgan Matajeski, uh, who's a teacher at Northeast. Uh, I think she's a graduate of Midland High. Her name uh, then was Morgan Grew, but big shout out to her because having an additional person at both buildings to help me out was uh, was awesome. At Northeast, uh, not, not only, at, well, both programs, we like to do an hour of math, an hour of English, and a fun activity. So each school picked a theme. Uh, for Northeast, they chose the Amazing Race, and they wanted to bring some cultural learning into the program. So the first day they got uh, passports, and then they would br the teachers made sure to incorporate different cultures into their lessons. Uh, we had a speaker from Uga Uganda. We uh, had a golf pro from Sandy Ridge come and do some free golf lessons for the kids. Um, and uh, they even had a salsa making contest. So it was, it was kind of a, a, a very, it was an awesome program for the kids. Um, at Jefferson, uh, again, the teachers were awesome, great planning. They did an amazing job coming up with the theme for the kids. Blast off into a new adventure. One of, uh, one of the things they did was uh, to incorporate, make predictions about uh, rockets if they launched rockets, um, included graphing, included area, um, what kind of parachute would work best for these rockets. Um, so that was a cool thing that they did. They had a, a presenter from Cranbrook come and talk about water pollution. And then uh, we had a physics professor from Delta College come, and he, he talked. He did some great demos with uh, optics, uh, angular momentum, and standing waves, which included a strobe light. The kids really loved that one. <laughs> um, but yeah, oh, and then they went to the Chippewa Nature Center one day and did a scavenger hunt. Um, so that was pretty cool for the kids. Uh, some. Uh, great feedback. I'll, I'm, you, you could read what's up there, but one really stood out to me uh, was the summer school was great. People actually understood me. They knew it's hard for me to speak in front of others and understand that I have anxiety. Finally, people are really nice here, especially the teachers. So it, it just meant a lot to see that. I know that's one kid's feedback, but uh, someone that experiences anxiety and that it really helped them out to get to know the school, get to know the teachers, and just feel welcome. All right. Up next, we got high school. That sounded awesome. All right. Uh, well, good evening. I'm Scott Cochran, principal at Dow High School. So thanks for taking a few minutes to talk with us tonight about summer school. At uh, Dow High, we really focus on a data-informed model as far as who is participating. Uh, in summer school, we had five teachers supporting 47 students, so the teachers recommended students for participation. We reached out to families. They reached out to families, I should say. And we were looking specifically at students needing support in math and English. 
Um, and and the, the form of instruction was through small groups. So over the course of the summer, we had 38 and a half credits that were earned. Now these are credits towards graduation, uh, taking off boxes on the graduation uh, uh, model that our students need to achieve. Uh, of those, uh, just over 20 English credits and 18 math credits. So these are credits that the students were short on going into the summer and then, of course, coming out. Not only do they earn the credits, but they also uh, achieve success in the class, which is probably just as important. Um, and uh, some of the, we don't have quotes up here, but it was interesting hearing some of the feedback um, from a number of the students were talking about the way that they would approach uh, interacting with their teacher differently the next school year, this upcoming school year that starts tomorrow, and also their pace of work. Uh, how the cons they recognize the importance of the consistency uh, of, of getting their work done. So I thought that was interesting. Uh, I listed a number of the courses that uh, students earn credits in, English 9, American Lit, Literature and Language, so pretty much the entire English sequence, um, Algebra 1, Geometry and Algebra 2, the core math sequence, and there were a few other classes as well. Um, now, I'm presenting because, you know, I'm here to talk to you tonight, but I was not involved in this program at all. I didn't become the principal until July 1st. This all happened in June, so I want to make sure the credit goes where credit is due. Our previous principal, Ted Davis, uh, kind of led the charge, and, of course, it couldn't happen without the teachers. Uh, and I listed them here for you because the teachers are our heroes. Uh, Brent Chambers, Sharon Kachelski, Tom McNamara, Sarah Pirrett, and Jason Watkins. You know, they, they spent the time with the students there four days a week, uh, helping them uh, design targeted specific lessons for them and did a great job. We put down the logo success for all and our students were successful. Uh, walked away from the summer with additional credits but also feeling good about themselves and their ability to be successful in school coming into this school year. So it was a good experience. All right. Thank you. Just turn it over to Sheila. Okay. Good evening. I'm Tila Sherman. I'm the principal at Midland High School. Um, my perception of summer school is a little bit more anecdotal, and Amy Guzman, who was our summer school supervisor, will provide more specific data. Uh, we approach summer school uh, with the lens that many of our students, we had a, a pretty high failure rate, uh, no more than normal in any school, but we had a high failure rate where we really wanted to get kids credit to get back on track to graduate. Our focus certainly was freshmen and sophomores, but we did have juniors and seniors that engaged in summer school. Um, and many of them got back on track to graduate on time. So that was really our intent. Um, it was both high schools, I believe. We did a summer school from June 5th to June 29th, two sessions a day. So we had a three-hour session in the morning and a three-hour session in the afternoon. Some students, most students, uh, accessed both sessions to make up those credits. Um, the beauty was that we were allowed to, because there wasn't any construction, thank you, we were allowed to run it. And it, it matters. It matters to teachers. It matters to students, especially when you're trying to build and maintain a culture, um, that we were able to run summer school in our own building. Uh, the, le the comfort level, both from teachers and students, was substantial. So I appreciate that effort. Um, we offered... A variety of courses face to face. We put out uh, like an APB to all teachers, anyone interested in teaching summer school in January. Um, we were taking all because we had students that had failed across the board in, in a variety of classes. So the student or the teachers that um, were hired to teach summer school, we were able to fill their courses all the way from algebra one up to or to U.S. history. So it was a variety. Uh, the classes that we weren't able to offer face to face experiences, I believe that face to face experiences are magical and really important. However, we needed to get kids back on track to graduate as well. So I groveled um, if we could uh, maybe offer some virtual options with support by Amy. And we also had a, a special ed um, certified teacher in there as well. Take some ingenuity courses that we weren't offering face to face. If we offered it face to face, they were put with a teacher. But if they weren't, um, if we weren't offering it, we put them with Ms. Guzman and Mr. Uh, Wagner. Um, 75 students were enrolled in, at the Midland High uh, Summer School. And again, that's grade 9 through 12, current 12th graders. Um, we had uh, Amy Guzman was our online facilitator. She was an online facilitator, but she was also our summer school facilitator. And it, without her, our summer school program wouldn't have been as successful. 
Um, one of the major reasons that our program is successful, I think both high schools, is that man uh, attendance is mandatory. If students uh, don't attend, if they miss two days, they can't stay in summer school. And believe it or not, that is a significant motivator. 99% of our students stayed enrolled. I think we only lost Z oh, we only on zero. Zero. Great. 100%. So we, one hundred percent. So, um, a hundred percent of our students earned at least a half a credit. So a half a credit, for those of you that don't know, is a semester course. And so we had some students coming in with substantial deficiencies, and we had some students coming in with just a half a credit or a point one or a full credit to recover. Um, one thing I might note: I don't have quotes as eloquently as the others. However, um, by the time they get to this level, many of these students have already established a shame or a perception, um, and they function in traditional school with this shame, and it, it manifests in a, a variety of ways, but one could be avoidance, which a lot of our students who are at risk or are failing, uh, they avoid class because they don't want to look or seem inept, right? Uh, and they're really trying to save face, or it manifests in, uh, in behaviors uh, to, instead of looking dumb, they would rather get kicked out of class. And so these b behaviors perpetuate, and they've established this. These are long behaviors, and so I'm really appreciative of the, the um, elementary and the middle schools really focusing on building culture and SEL supports because it's going to help build that efficacy with those students. However, once they're at high school, in the structure that we had, it's a smaller class setting, of course, that's always beneficial. Um, but we also used different um, assessment methods, so it wasn't your traditional testing. Um, and we really honed in on essential standards. So you, in five weeks, it's tough to teach a semester long in five weeks. Um, but they focused in on, or teachers, before they taught the class, they identified essential standards. What do kids need to know in order to articulate proficiency in that class? Uh, teachers really focused on that. But then they were very creative in the ways in which they measured success by these students, and they really allowed students to choose that, which was quite lovely because so often these students feel like they don't have a voice in the classroom. So I'm going to stop rambling, and I'm going to let Amy share some data, but I'm really proud of Midland High students. 100% of our students um, gained at least a half a credit, so it's huge. And with the attendance, hi, I'm Amy Guzman. I teach at Midland High School. Um, some of the attendants, like a student, may have lost their morning but not their afternoon, so they were still able to recover that half credit or vice versa. Um, so we did have a 100% success, success rate of all 75 students. Um, we were able to recover, six, students were able to recover 65 credits overall. Um, in particular, some students are now a senior. They will be ready to graduate. Uh, in May, so for Midland High School. So that's very uh, much a celebration. Some of the courses that we offered, because we had um, the, the availability to offer Ingenuity, would be French 1, uh, French 2, Spanish, Survey of Spanish 1, Survey of Spanish 2, Geometry, um, Chemistry, Lifelong Fitness, uh, Earth Science, Government, Econ, and um, those were just a few. The face-to-face, -face, again, we did make sure we were uh, looking at our, our English and language arts as well as math scores and as well as building those essential skills uh, for this fall. In algebra, algebra two, English nine, English 10, English 11, biology, world history, U.S. history, and then health, a requirement for graduation. Um, I do have some quotes uh, through our student data that we collected at the beginning and then their reflection at the end. One of the questions read, why did you attend summer school this year? Because I had to. <laughs> I didn't do the work. Uh, so much of my work wasn't turned in. I didn't go to school during the school year, and I missed a lot of school. We talked about what content they were able to pick up and their effort. Those were a couple questions that we asked for post data. Uh, what did you like most about summer school? Actually getting my work done and getting a good grade. It wasn't boring. The classes were small. Lunch, friends, it wasn't really that terrible. The people, what did you like least about summer school? Everything. Honestly, just all the tests in both classes, but I get it. It's necessary to know if a student is picking up a lesson being taught. I'd like being here, 
being here instead of being home. I like the short, I didn't like the short lunch. And these are just a few that I'll end with. What did you learn about yourself? That I can bike for a while. That I can do more than I thought I could. I'm determined to get through this time. Next year won't be a reason I don't show up. It's not that hard getting up in the morning. That I don't ever want to come or come to summer school again. I know more than I thought I can stay consistent and work hard. I just need to focus. And then finally, what were some celebrations? I passed, getting my credit. That it's over. I did well in my post test. I am passing. I'm back on track. Grades and accomplishments. Uh, Midland High also had the opportunity to do similar to a kindergarten readiness program. We recognize that it's very difficult to transition from middle school to high school. Uh, we do, my math teachers have been voicing this for a while um, that students coming into ninth grade, there's a substantial many students there's a substantial gap and many of them are not ready to jump into algebra they don't have the fundamentals for uh, with regards to pre-algebra to jump right into algebra which is where we start um, so we tried to think of something that we could get incoming eighth grade students engaged in um, we had 14 freshmen attend. We invited 60. It, it's really hard to convince high schoolers to come to <laughs> summer school, especially if they're not credit deficient yet. So um, they were given, there was two sessions. We had a, a substantial SEL cultural uh, component, and that was run by our SEL specialist. And then we had the pre-algebra component, and they were broken up into two groups, and then they would flop at, uh, after an hour and a half. Um, and so they, uh, similar to what was happening at elementary, we weren't teaching them how to get on the bus or off the bus, uh, but we were teaching them where the cafeteria was and what uh, the, the fundamentals of what it means to have chemic pride, and this is how you represent yourself. And um, they also made a connection with a strong math teacher as well as a strong co-teacher in that classroom as well. We did use NWA data to identify students that we um, targeted or invited. Uh, it was also based on eighth grade teacher recommendation and the assistant principal. Keith Seibert um, provided some feedback on who we should invite as well but it was specifically students that were from Northeast um, we didn't have the school of choice transfers yet so it was just uh, students that were engaged in um, academics or at, in school at Northeast but this was pretty cool they um, we were allowed I again groveled I'm getting pretty good at begging we were allowed to um, award these students a half of a credit so these students are already ahead of the of most of their middle school counterparts because they got an elective credit if they participated in if they engaged in this learning so these students do have an elective credit and so we're already getting them started on the right track so it was very successful I just would like more students next year that's my goal Okay, as promised, I'm just going to touch on a bit of our multilingual learner English support program that we offered this summer. Um, again, we took teacher, um, actually our, our tutor uh, specialist um, recommendation. We invited a lot of students to participate. Um, we had 15 overall that, that took us up on that. Um, we could have had more, uh, but I did not have enough of our specialist time. Um, we did have uh, John Mulvaney, who is our multilingual learner advisor. He offered tutoring support, um, and then three of our specialists that worked during the year. Um, so many of them worked with students that they had during, during the school year. What was brilliant about this opportunity is that we partnered with um, the Legacy Center here in Midland. Um, if you're not familiar, the Legacy Center does offer tutoring support, literacy support for um, not only youth but adult learners in our community. So one um, exceptional highlight, uh, actually a couple, um, but we were able to introduce the Legacy Center to our families. Um, and so several of them signed up for um, tutoring support themselves. Um, but one particular student who is a rising sixth grader, um, he and his sister came in mid-year mid last year, and they are um, they were refugees, and so um, I can only imagine what they've been through. Uh, but he was very resilient, um, very, very stern, not really wanting to engage, very little English skills. But when he met Mr. Mulvaney and realized that Mr. Mulvaney also works with his father, 
that that really broke down a lot of barriers and right away established a, a, a very um, authentic relationship. So we're hoping for um, continued partnership with the Legacy Center and um, just you know growing those opportunities for not only our students but our families. And I think we have got one more slide. That's me. Yep. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> What questions do you have for myself <laughs> or any one of our team members tonight? Um, this is such a wonderful, wonderful program, and you guys have really just, it's one of my favorite presentations I look forward to because it keeps getting better. Every year is better, 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 and I love it. Um, with that in mind, and, th and this is worthy of more compliments than, than we have time tonight. To, to be honest, uh, but I, I just the question that I have is as we continue driving engagement and, and wanting to get numbers higher and higher, how do we get past 90 percent, 100 percent? What can we do to keep improving this program? Or what plans do you have to keep improving the program? Maybe better stated. Well. I would say that we will continue to lean on our data and um, really take input from our stakeholders and, and value what, what they want. Um, obviously, 90% attendance, you know, there's, there's uh, buy-in there. 100% of our students at Midland High gaining, you know, a partial credit at, at minimum. So I feel, you know, as long as we have the, um, I'm looking at superintendent, <laughs> Penny Miller Nelson, but as long as you know you saw the funding that that went behind yeah. the amazing work that our team um, presented you this evening, so we'll continue to work at looking for those um, supplemental pots of funds that will continue to um, provide these opportunities for our students and staff. Wonderful. I will. Okay. Add, can I add really <laughs> quick? One of the things that we could uh, do better in is um, it needs to be part of our culture. It's still pretty new, and so it's uh, the communication to parents and to students and to it's 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 um it's easy to opt out, if you will. And so if we can continue to make this a part of our ingrained culture, that if you're at least at the high school, I don't know at the elementary or the middle school, if you are credit deficient, you you have to do summer school because graduating is not an option. And so continuing to articulate that message, I think, is relevant. So. I also think to add to, you know, we had talked, I think someone mentioned it was last January that we started to have conversation about building for this year and people now are already like, we're not waiting till January. We've got the That's surveys, we're, we're, we heard the students, we heard the families, we heard the teachers. What can we do new or different or what tweaks do we need to make to make it even better next year? So really leaning on you know, the responses, you know, again, to Central Park's credit, you know, they really took to heart what families said last year and um, restructured this year and had an amazing program with even more students attending. So uh, being responsive to that. Excellent. So I have a quick question to start and then I'm probably a more complicated question. The first one is, are PATH students at the high school level, did your numbers include our PATH students or are they on a separate That's track a separate throughout the year? program completely they get all year to engage in okay. that work and it's overseen by the principal of that program Jeff Lauer yeah. so these are students that are enrolled in our face-to-face -face programming okay and one thing with that remember the students had failed that class before so they were able to do a prescriptive test yeah. to identify what um, essential standards they've already mastered mm -hmm. and then we were able to build their class off of that okay okay and then my my second question is I'm going to make a hypothesis that we have a high correlation between the students that are in summer school that also have an IEP or need tier two and three MTSS stu services. Not Is that necessarily. not necessarily? No. I guess my for the students that do need those services, mm -hmm. how are our partners at ESA helping us deliver the summer school program? And do they do they provide support through the summer? We don't ask for it. We use our we use our special education teachers. So many of our courses, I don't know at Delphi, many of our courses were co-taught 
um, with a, a certified special education teacher, our own special education teacher. So we did that. I don't think we, I, I don't want to say we didn't need them. We just have, we have our own teachers and our own resources that we utilize that have relationships with our kids and the teachers that they're co-teaching with. I would say at Dow, I can speak to what was happening. At Dow, we had the special ed staff that were involved as well in a similar fashion. We were co-teaching or working directly yeah. uh, in small groups with the students. So uh, I'm not sure that we saw ESA involvement for that for that instruction. At yeah, the I might. school, oh. we had two special ed teachers each program. You want me to go up there? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> at the middle school, we had two special education teachers for each program, and we had two paraprofessionals for each program to help with that. So to sharpen there. that point, we'll just say ESA staff were not part of our summer school program, and to, to address your question about two, tier two or three support separate from special education, that's part of why we really need to keep enhancing our tiered system of support. Those should be ways that we actually change the trajectory for mm -hmm. students so that they're earning yeah. these credits during the school year and not needing summer school. So we still right. have some work to do there. I mean, our ideal, I think we would all agree, is to have summer school be enrichment, not necessarily credit recovery in the secondary schools um, or students who are not yet proficient. We'd like it to be enrichment, but we're not there yet. And I think one area, uh, to go back to Scott's question of how we can think about growth, we are right now in some ways limited uh, by the number of teachers who are able to uh, teach during the summer. We have great teachers who are giving a lot, but many of them want their summertime for other priorities. So we're a little bit limited in the number of students we can serve in summer school. Ideally, it would not just be students who are credit deficient at the high school. It would be those who maybe just peaked by, but still aren't as ready as they need to be for success in the next class, giving them that boost for even increased readiness for the fall. So we have lots of ways that we can keep growing and evolving our summer school program. Go ahead. Um, all of the funding that you listed, um, there are ESSER-related pieces to that, which will sunset. Do we have to start looking at um, general fund dollars to a lot? Do, do we need a line item? to start building so that we don't have any limits. If we have limits yeah. in teachers, we cannot have a limit in funds. We have to be able to, if it's gonna become cultural, right. that you're gonna change this, then we gotta talk about dollars. And we yeah. have to start planning if we can grow those numbers and grow the teachers so they take that limit out of it as well. I think we have to start looking at a line item for this. Yeah, I don't think it's off the table to use general fund dollars. I'll make eye contact with Brian. We've had conversations <laughs> about this. You know, we're really thankful that we're getting a fuller 31A allocation. Absolutely. And so those funds, actually, this is a perfect match for those funds. But to your point, lots of ESSER and other supplemental related funds that are sunsetting and we have to figure out what goes where. But this summer, summer learning programs will always be a priority for us. I just wanted to also say in regards to the, the funding piece, um, I think that it is so critical, the identification that we're recognizing what families need, right? If they need transportation, that's part of what we're spending our money on in order to help get kids where they need to go. The food piece, the, um, the, the pride piece, the fun piece, the engagement piece, because I think that is what helps to change the, you know, takes away that shame of, oh, you have to go to summer school, right? I, I can't tell you how many families I've talked to have been like, my kids love summer school. Like, it's great. It's great for our family. It's great for them. They're more prepared. They're ready. Um, especially those y younger kiddos and so I just I'm in awe that I, I remember sitting there last year and listening to this and being like whoa um, and so just again kudos to all of you for developing a wonderful wonderful enrichment program for our kids Okay then.
Okay, next up we have item 3.3. This is Superintendent Leadership Focus uh, presented by our Superintendent, Miller Nelson. I'm gonna stand here because then I can make eye contact with you. Good evening. Like all fun things so far, right? Mm -hmm. I want you to know that I am really grateful and proud to serve and lead our entire school community here at Midland Public Schools. I noted that in my welcome back message uh, to our school community, and I shared that I want to be the kind of leader that works collaboratively in service to our students, our staff, our families, and our community partners. I also noted that leadership change can be challenging for individuals and for our organization. And at the same time, a leadership change can be really exciting and renewing and full of possibilities. And I'm working intentionally for that second part to be true, for us to see all the possibilities that we have ahead. At our opening session, I also shared the sentiment that being interim can uh, also create just a little bit of a ripple, right? Uh, people aren't always sure exactly what to expect next, and I certainly don't want folks to think that this is just a placeholder. I really um, want to convey to you tonight, again, that I believe I am here to help move us forward in alignment with our vision. We have important work to do, and if we are standing still, we're falling behind. So we really do need to keep moving forward together. We have a really powerful vision statement to lead with respect, trust, and courage, to ensure an equitable, collaborative, and inclusive culture, and to enable all to achieve success. It's important to me that you know I believe in this vision statement, and I believe in our collective ability to achieve it. You can count on me and our great leadership team here and our leaders out in our schools to lead and serve in these ways with respect, trust, and courage. And I believe I can count on you as board members to do the same. Having this mutual understanding of how we as a governance team will work together is important so that we can achieve this vision and ensure success for all. I want you to leave this evening with a clear understanding and a feeling that there is strong, visioned, aligned, and caring leadership for our district and that there is a clear, focused, defined path forward for us this school year. I'm going to share with you a brief overview of my areas of focus as part of a leadership plan uh, for the 23-24 school year. The three areas are community, student success, and leadership. These are the central themes of my service to Midland Public Schools. For each area, I'll provide a little bit more context I'll give you an example of an action that I will be taking in each focus area, and then you'll see in the corner of the slide uh, for each of these areas a box that has accountability measures, ways that I will measure and you can hold me accountable to making progress. As you listen, I ask you to look for opportunities to support the various aspects of this plan and to think about ways that you can make it better, ideas you have for me to make it better. Community is the first area. To be a community, we need to need connection and communication among people. I will foster a trusting, inclusive, collaborative, uh, and productive relationships that will strengthen our school community. This work happens with you as Board of Education members, with our students, our parents, our families, our staff, and our community partners. I will be visible, approachable, and engaged in the school community. One action I've already taken is to schedule, along with principals and our associate superintendent team, a series of monthly school visits. We are going to be out in schools even more than we already were. We're also moving our Monday morning leadership team meetings, called agenda meetings, it's an internal term we use. We're moving those out to schools. So rather than meeting here at the admin building, we're rotating through schools each Monday. This will include Brian and Jeff, Melissa and Jen, and our department directors, technology, HR, business, et cetera, so that we can all get out and see what's happening in schools. This is about us being seen together, 
so that uh, staff and students know that we're here and that we care and that we're engaged. And it's also about us keeping a pulse on what's happening in schools so that we can provide support when we see the need and make well-informed decisions. We will be looking for other opportunities as well to listen, to understand different perspectives and ideas and feedback from students and staff. It doesn't mean there will always be agreement, but it does mean that I can be counted to lean into situations and work through them with respect uh, and to do that collaboratively. Uh, we are finding lots of other ways also to engage in the school community. I see lots of events on my calendar and I'm really excited to get out and engage with families and community partners. <coughs> you might have heard we've already launched a staff survey. We did that last Monday and that was to get staff feedback on specific topics related to culture and climate as well as communication and we are level setting on what the words respect, trust, and courage mean so there was an opportunity to provide input. That survey remains open for the next couple of weeks and we'll be digging into that data once the survey closes. One piece of feedback we've already heard fairly consistently is that we need to give a little more attention to communication across the district. We already have many great modes. Uh, Mike Shero put lots of great modes of communication in place. We just need to take that to the next level and really think about how two-way communication can happen across the district. So we are right now engaged in the early stages of assessing our current communications plan and developing a refreshed approach. And we'll share more information about that uh, in the coming months. I believe the culture we create and maintain as the adults in the system is important for our success and for that of students. So this year we're really gonna tend to our culture, that working and learning environment that we're all in so that we can be equitable, collaborative, and inclusive. Student success. Teaching and learning are clearly the heart of what we do, and wherever we have an opportunity, we're gonna talk about that. Uh, we want to, we will maintain a sharp focus on student growth and achievement this year. We are an excellent school district. I think we all know that. So many ways, so many examples we can point to, and one of those is student achievement. We have dedicated, caring, highly skilled staff, and we are in the top 5% of Michigan schools. We should be proud. And we also have students who are not yet achieving at the levels that we desire. We just heard that about summer school, right? So both are true, and it's important for us to really embrace this reality and to dig in together to find new and better ways to reach each student and engage families, eliminate those barriers to success. Actions in this focus area of student success will require us to continue developing that tiered system of support that we just referenced with uh, the whole child in mind. This means that we will continue the social emotional well-being strategies that we have in place and we will continue the hard academic press that we have. We will adapt and rethink our curriculum, our instruction, our intervention, and our assessment practices to ensure that each student has an equitable opportunity to learn in a safe and inclusive culture and that they are excited to come to school. You've been listening a lot tonight, but I'm just gonna ask if I can take a little extra two minutes because I want to address that term equitable opportunity or equitable access. I wanna give some context so that we understand what it means in this example of student success, especially since equity is referenced a couple times on the slide. So I thought maybe giving an example would create a more vivid picture. Equitable access or opportunity to learn is really about considering what each child needs, what each student needs to be ready to learn and have access to that learning experience. It's giving them the best possible chance for success. It's us considering all of those pieces and then taking action. It might not be the same for the student in the next seat over or two seats over. So here's an example. We have a student and their family who are currently experiencing poverty and many of the associated challenges of experiencing poverty. How are we noticing that? How are we responding? Are we collaborating with the family and the student in positive, productive, and dignified ways to ensure that the student can get to school every day on time, that they have appropriate nutrition, that they have the necessary supplies they need, 
that they feel safe and cared for at school and they're ready to learn? Are we considering that this same family might not have the capacity to help their child with homework every night because they're working evening or night shifts? And maybe that we need to adjust our expectations for homework. And that family's work situation might be a barrier to attending parent-teacher conferences or other school events. So are we thinking of different ways to communicate and stay connected with that family? And for the sake of my example, let's consider that this child has some academic challenges and is not yet proficient in math or literacy. And I just want to point out uh, that is not a generalization. We recognize not every student experiencing poverty is also academically uh, experiencing academic challenges. But for the sake of this example, are we being responsive to the specific learning needs that that child has and at the same time holding them to the very highest expectation to meet our academic standards because we truly believe that they can do it? Are we thinking about alternative ways the student can show their knowledge and skill to uh, show that they have met that academic standard because that's what's best for them? Are we considering access to after school supports and events that we know enrich learning like tutoring or robotics or sports or other clubs? You just heard us talk about transportation and, and food for summer school. Those are great examples. Those are just a few of the considerations and how we can take action to support that student in that example I gave. And that's what it means to really think about equity and meeting the needs of a student so that they have access to learning and can be ready for learning in the classroom. It's, it's not easy. It's actually quite complex, especially when you have 7,400 plus students and each of them might have a little unique need that we need to meet. And I, I know too it's happening in pockets across the district. As I've said many, many times, we have amazing teachers uh, who are very skilled and dedicated. But this isn't the responsibility of just a classroom teacher. It's our system responsibility. It's our district responsibility to really ensure that this is happening consistently across the board. So we need to deepen those practices and systematize them uh, as part of what Midland Public Schools looks and feels like. This is focusing on our tiered system of support and really building out that continuous improvement model. It also connects with ongoing professional learning for all the adults in the system. So speaking of professional learning, another point on student success is that we are going to this year spend time more deeply embracing the fact that we too are learners. The adults in the system have to be learners. We're going to strengthen our structures through professional learning communities in our middle and high schools. And in our elementaries, we're engaging with a literacy leadership network. And I look forward to sharing more this year or having members of our team share more about those uh, collaborative structures later this year. Research and evidence-based practices are frequently emerging. There's new brain and learning science all the time, and it really takes effort to stay current. So these professional learning structures are really equ helping equip us to stay on top of, uh, of best practice, uh, highly effective practices. And really, there are times where we're going to get to a spot and we might not have a right answer in front of us. Some of these scenarios, especially those individual student situations can be really tricky. So we're gonna need to just lean in, seek knowledge outside of ourselves and be able to bring that back and network it through these professional learning communities and our literacy, uh, leaning into literacy initiative. These uh, structures will serve as platforms for connection, communication, learning growth, and ultimately as a structure that will increase educator agency. And I really believe that it's going to deepen our knowledge and skill, reinforce our collective commitment to student success and continuous improvement, and help us see all those possibilities ahead. The structures also require team goals and targeted actions. And we know that when we're part of an effective team, that's really accomplishing important work. It increases our sense of connection with our colleagues, our sense of community, our job satisfaction, and our well being. So I see this very uh, tightly linked back to the first uh, area of focus as well. Again, we'll share more information about those structures soon. Leadership is the third area of focus. 
I'll serve and lead this district with integrity, courage, flexibility, and clarity to align and focus resources and optimize organizational efforts, ensuring high performance. I hope you can see um, you know, the other two lengthy descriptions that these are connected back because leadership is critical to make uh, the other two happen. But I kept this one in its own discrete focus area because it really matters that we tend to all aspects of our organization. You know, we typically want to think about what's happening in a classroom or a school, but the things that happen here at central office and those underpinnings of the district structure really matter and make it all possible. So when we think about finance and technology, human resources, facility, food service, transportation, all of those really matter and so do the people who work in those departments. They are part of our team. So we're gonna tend to our organizational capacity and efficiency because it's important. When those pieces are optimal, the service and support to teachers and principals and students and families is optimal. And we have some really highly effective practices already happening, so we need to identify those and scale them across departments, and we need to keep seeking areas for improvement and efficiency. One action item I've already started in this area is to carry forward with the facilities assessment process that was started last spring. Of course, in collaboration with the board uh, subcommittee and with Brian, we've analyzed information and, and the input that we've gathered so far. We've really closely examined our needs. We're considering the future of our district and are in the process, as you know, of drafting this facility plan that will take us into the future. Lots of opportunities still for stakeholder feedback along the way. This is by no means a done project, but it is an important project that will set us up to continue providing the world-class experience that we know we want for students here in Midland. This focus area of leadership, again, connects back uh, to community with connection and communication and culture in many ways. The critical responsibility that we have as a governance team uh, can't be overstated. So in this area, I'm drawing attention to the fact that I will work to develop uh, close, trusting, productive relationships with each of you as board members and with us holistically as a governance team. It's really important that we are aligned and connected in service to the district. Again, uh, as I said before, we might not always agree and that's okay. I want us to be able to lean into dialogue and to seek understanding and one another's perspectives and of course function from a place of respect trust and courage while we keep students centered in our work. All right, team, those are my focus areas. Um, know that it was an overview, there are more action steps, and those will also be refined as we seek input. That staff survey, we intend to gather input from students and families and uh, community partners. That will all inform how we enact and take action around these three focus areas. I, I really believe that Midland Public Schools is a special place and I'm so proud to serve our school community. I have tremendous confidence in our team's ability to accomplish really great things this year and hold ourselves to the high expectations that I know you want us to have for ourselves and others in our system. So as we begin this new chapter, I ask you as board members to join me in stepping forward together into the bright space of collaboration, and open communication, optimism, respect, trust, and courage, of course, and to see all the amazing possibilities that we have ahead. When we can work from that common space, we can move through the hard parts, and I'm sure there will be hard parts this year, but we can move through those while keeping students and staff centered in our work. Thank you for believing and trusting in me to serve our district this year. What feedback do you have or questions might you have? Um, thank you, Penny. That was great. The thing that I'm maybe most excited about, especially from a board perspective, is the more data-driven approach. Um, as a parent, we get to see directly how our student is doing. And when we get the paperwork sent home, whether it's NWEA or other, other forms of data, it's pretty easy for us to tell exactly how our student's doing. What's more difficult for us as a board, I think, to measure is how the district as a whole is doing. We can see what we saw four or five months ago um, 
when we looked at the the data for all of our students, but really to lean into that analytical okay. approach and see where we even maybe need to reach outside of the traditional public school know-how to, to really measure success yeah. and know, you know, Brad's made the point a number of times, like when we align the budget to where we, from a data-driven standpoint, had success, that's a really productive place for us to spend dollars um, and communicate with our community and, and parents and other stakeholders about where we are having success and then be really transparent about where we're not having success. So to the extent that you need additional resources, especially financial resources outside of what we've traditionally done to do that, the, the deep data dive, I'll speak for myself in saying that I would support some additional look on that um, and something that we might want to consider bringing back to the board for review in the future. Great, thanks for that. Any other? Thank you, Penny. Right. We're, we're awesome. really excited moving forward. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next up, we have an action item. This is our RFP for the superintendent search firm, and this is going to be presented by Phil. Yes, so if you remember last month, we put in the agenda packet for information in accordance with the uh, superintendent search calendar that we had presented back in May or June. Yeah. Um, that said, in, in July, we would issue to the board and to the public the superintendent search firm RFP. And this was uh, drafted in, in cooperation with our attorney f attorneys at Thrun Law Firm. Um, so I present this for action tonight to actually uh, approve um, that we we actually go issue this this uh, search firm RFP. RFP. Okay, I will. Um, accept the motion to approve the RFP for the superintendent search firm. I'll move to approve um, item 3.4. 3.4, the RFP for superintendent search firm services. Support. Um, motion. Discussion. Yeah, I'll get there. Motion by Mr. Roush, support by Ms. Ringgold. Any additional discussion? Um, just some additional notes uh, to highlight for both the board and the public. Mm -hmm. One of the sections of the RFP are RFP response elements. As listed, there are nine. Maybe just to add a little bit more color to that, um, I think we should discuss as a board, when we find the, the correct search firm, really look for somebody that demonstrates that the firm truly can develop uh, relatively quickly intimate knowledge of the district and our cultures and values of our community, current incredible testimonies from other districts that they've served, experience, um, particularly around size of districts, um, price negotiation experience, and then a track record of really involving all of the community. I think that's one of the things that we highlighted during, during our calendar that we had laid out for the board to review was really be very transparent about collecting the voice of our teachers, our parents, and, and uh, students, and all of our staff in the, in the process to make sure that we find the, the right person going forward. I've got a question, Phil. Yep. Is the subcommittee responsible for making the ultimate recommendation back to the board? So we, help me out yeah. here, because from a okay. governance standpoint, been really particular about yep. making sure that we bring everything back here yep. for full discussion. Okay. So the subcommittee really isn't taking any action. We're just kind of doing work and bringing You're doing it to the work. The board. You'll be going through the vetting <coughs> process of the RFP and then bringing the recommendation back to the board. Okay. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you. Yep. Any other questions, comments? I have a little bit of a nit. That's okay. by their proper name because we have centers of honor in those entities. So I just want to make sure that we're using that effectively because it's just sort of from them takes that information and uses 
We can, yeah, good point. We can definitely double check this. Any other comments? Okay. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you very much. Just for board awareness, if I can add before we move on. So looking at the timeline that we put out, so September, mm -hmm. So we did what we said we were going to do in August. In September, we said we would issue the RFP to various search firms um, and bring that back to the board. October, um, so really not any action for the, the full board to take in September other than to know that the RFP actually went out. And then in October, uh, we would narrow it down um, from however many we issue to three and interview those firms. Yeah, I think that's right. Okay, moving on. That takes us to item number four tonight, request to address the board. And I only have one name on my list, and that is Mr. Joe Bonides. Thank you for joining us tonight. Greetings. At the uh, July meeting, I talked about the lack of a continuity of learning plan for 22-23 school year. I thank Vice President Rauch for explaining that the state no longer requires the creation of that document. Interesting, since ESSER funds are still being used. I did have a chance to review the request for proposal for the superintendent hiring services. Lots of legalese and boilerplate, but in the back was the background section for Midland. You have provided an over-the-top description of Sparkle City in this document. Positive descriptions of large companies, all of whom are in cost containment and recent layoff mode, the part about places a strong emphasis on communication and community relationships was not aligned with calling the public various names and stonewalling issues that should have seen the light, like the recent plastic genitalia incident that had no legal follow-up action. And the final point about confidently passing bond issues is an amazing bit of hubris in these recession recessionary times as the recent failure of the uh, Meridian bond issue might give you warning. What I am most concerned about is the lack of any expectation that the new superintendent will address the 35% of the student's population in the 31A at-risk pool. You are not looking for someone to sell a new car. We don't have a list of features that we want. We need to at least mention that this is not utopia, which gets me to my final point. As I mentioned last week, we need to learn from the last three years and not repeat the same mistakes. There are strong rumors, news items, a few solid pieces of information that the government is going to go back into lockdown mode again. There are multiple studies on many aspects of what did and did not work and what was not true the first time around. I'm not going to make this into a political debate, but the part I will push is masks don't work. I can give you another summary of the literature on why masks, masking asymptomatic people does not work, but you are crushing the souls of the students with masks. And you might not want to poke that bear again and go into auditorium-sized school board meetings when the mama bears wake up again. And if you, quote, took a bribe, unquote, by accepting ESSER funds and are required to mask the kids, I would like to have that information on the public record. Thank you. Okay, I know I, uh, there were a few people that came in after uh, the list was given to me. So is there anybody in the audience who would like to address the board? Okay, we will move on then. Uh, next up, item five, finance facilities and operations. Uh, we have minutes that will be read by Mr. Blazy. The meeting was held here at the Middle Public Schools Administration Center. Present were uh, Chairman John Lauterbach, myself, John Hatfield, Penny Miller Nelson, and Brian Bruton. Guests were French and Associates, Dale Jerome and Barton Mallow, Jeff Atkins, Kelsey Burkmeyer, and Daryl Dombrow. We discussed the Franklin property. Committee feedback was sought on the potential sale of the former, former Franklin School property. The sale presents the possibility of a partnership between Habitat for Humanity and the Midland Public Schools Building Trades Program. 
We also are continuing on with our facilities study. The committee met with the representatives from French and Associates and Barton Mallow to continue discussions started at the June FFO meeting. Our next meeting was then in August, on August 7th. Again, we met here at the Administration Center. Uh, same people were present, Mr. Lauterbach, myself, Mr. Hatfield, Penny Miller Nelson, and Brian Bruton. Also had French and Associates, Dale Jerome, and Barton Mallow was Daryl Dombro, Jeff Atkins, virtually, and Kelsey Berkmeyer, virtually. <coughs> As a committee, we discussed tax renewals. The committee feedback was sought on potential dates for renewals of the non-homestead and hold harmless millages. Administration will commence actions to place the items on the May 2024 ballot. Audit, the committee was given a general overview of the status of the audit. Audit, a full report by Yo and Yo will be delivered to the FFO committee and Board of Education in September. Tractor bid. Administration will recommend ordering a Kubota tractor for use by the maintenance department. If approved, this would replace the current tractor that was purchased in 1979. Funds for the tractor were built into the 23-24 general fund budget. Truck purchase. Administration will recommend ordering an F-350 pickup truck to be utilized by the maintenance and transportation departments. If approved, this would replace the current truck that was purchased in 1994. Funds for the truck were built into the 23-24 general fund budget. Facility study. The committee met with the representatives from French and Associates and Barton Mallow to continue discussions. Our next FFO meeting will be September 5th. Okay, thanks Brad. Mm -hmm. um, as alluded to, we have a couple action items. The first of which is item 5.2. This is the tractor purchase. Mr. Bruton. Yep. Thank you, Scott. As uh, Member Blazy just pointed out, we have accepted bids and provided you with a tabulation in your board packet for the purchase of a tractor. That tractor is to be assigned to the maintenance department if it has your approval this evening. We recommend issuing a purchase order to the low bidder that was Lingle Equipment out of Saginaw, Michigan in the amount of $31,384 and that's for a Kubota tractor. It's a four-wheel drive diesel with related accessories and as pointed out in the minutes, um, that is replacing a model that was purchased by the district in 1979. This was budgeted for in our general funds. Okay, thank you. I will accept the motion uh, for item 5.2. I move that we accept item 5.2, purchase of the Kubota tractor. Second. Support. <laughs> <laughs> motion by Mr. Hatfield, support by Mr. Roush. Any additional discussion for item 5.2? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Motion carries. Thank you. Best celebration for that 1979 tractor. <laughs> <laughs> I was just thinking. That, so. It's an old tractor. Yeah. So I'm pretty sure that might be the. I, I learned how to drive a stick shift while employed by Midland Public Schools in college. And that might have been the tractor. <laughs> You can bid on it in auction pretty soon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we installed it. We can. It's got if I know it too, we might drive the price up just yeah. a touch. <laughs> uh, Brian, item 5.3? Yes, sir. Um, we are also recommending this evening that we get your approval to order a 2024 F350 4x4. Um, this will be assigned to our maintenance and transportation department if it has your <coughs> approval. The um, bid comes from the state My Deal bidding program, and that price is provided by Lunghammer Ford of Owasso, Michigan. The total price is $54,168, and um, it will replace the current truck in the fleet that does the same functions. That truck was purchased in 1994 and is in dire need of replacement. Okay, I will. Thank you, Brian. I Thank will you. accept a motion for item 5.3. Motion to approve item 5.3 for a purchase of a new uh, 2024 F350 for $54,168. Motion by Mrs. Ringgold, support by Ms. Horowitz. Any additional discussion for item 5.3? Okay, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, motion carries, thank you very much. Next up, item 5.4 is information only, gifts totaling $4,300, Mr. Bruton. Thank you, sir. We have two gifts <coughs> to acknowledge this evening, as you pointed out, totaling $4,300. Um, one is from the Chestnut Hill PTO. They are providing classroom magazine subscriptions for the students at Chestnut Hill. Um, the other is from the Miriam Plus Memorial Endowed Scholarship Fund, and that provides support for students to take dance classes. We will, per tradition, honor both of those donors. 
in the credits of this meeting's broadcast and also through board correspondence. We certainly appreciate these generous donations on behalf of Midland Public Schools. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Uh, next up is item six, correspondence to and from the Board of Education. Item 6.1 uh, and 6.2 are both information only. Uh, 6.1 is letters to the Board of Education and 6.2 is letters from the Board of Education and the individuals uh, listed there um, can be found on the agenda. Uh, item seven is scheduled activities and that is the list of our remaining um, Board of Education meetings for 2023 as well as a tentative list for 2024. Um, noting there the budget workshops on April 15, 2024, um, as well as an organizational meeting and regular meeting on January 15, 2024. Uh, moving on to uh, study and discussion, uh, closing out our evening tonight, are there any points of clarification? Before I turn the floor over to Superintendent Miller Nelson for comments. Okay. You've heard from me a lot, so I'll be brief. I just want you all to know that our teachers, uh, of course, many have been in their classrooms over the summer preparing, but they were officially back last Monday and Tuesday for our opening session, and then an afternoon and a full day on Tuesday of professional learning. Uh, this team over here at the table, we, we were all out, some of us leaving PD, uh, Jen, and others of us just engaging some really, really great professional learning happening. Really proud of our team uh, for stepping up. Big thanks to all of the people, again, I mentioned them earlier, who are behind the scenes making sure that we're ready for the school year, our grounds and maintenance team, our transportation team, you know, our HR team uh, still making some of those last minute hires and getting those processed, our tech team making sure that everything's functional for our students. It's, uh, really great team effort around here, so want to extend gratitude to them. And then, of course, students are back tomorrow. Uh, lots of excitement around our community. We are really looking forward to welcoming back students for a great school year. Uh, central office staff will be out in schools every morning uh, these next couple of weeks, just greeting families and students and providing support to principals in those teams. Uh, we ask folks to, of course, have a little extra patience these first few weeks, bus routes are, you know, putting the final touches on, nothing goes quite exactly as speedy as we want it to, and there is a lot of construction still around town. So having uh, patience and grace for one another and leaving yourself a little extra time is really appreciated. Of course, our student safety is our most important concern. Um, I also just want to reaffirm, um, Brad read this in the FFO minutes, and I know we've talked about it at board meetings briefly, um, but we are uh, approaching the time for renewal of our non-homestead and our hold harmless millages, and we're gonna take those to the community in May of 24, as Brad read in those meeting minutes. Really important funds as part of our budget, and so we'll be sharing uh, more details about that plan as that date approaches, so we'll keep talking about it. That's all I have. We're really excited to welcome students back. It's going to be a great year. Okay. All right. With that, I will accept the motion to adjourn. Move to adjourn. Motion by Mr. Roush. Support. Support by Mr. Hatfield. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Better not. <laughs>